and we're live. Good morning, afternoon, evening, or night, everybody. What's up, Xavier? Nice to see you, sir. Scrapbook. Good morning, sir. Just jumping on live to talk a little bit about. I have an ongoing project where I want to try and discuss in easily accessible terms, but in detailed terms as well, like sort of the texture of titles, title claims, different kinds of championships that existed in the pre-ratings era before things got more formalized. But something that struck me when I started to study the old school was that, you know, at heavyweight you had the champion, but because the color line was drawn tight at heavyweight, you had a colored heavyweight world champion at the same time. You can see here, this is a newspaper article from, it's either late December 1902 or early January 1903, but it's recapping 1902. You can see they list the champions. Heavyweight, James J. Jeffries, Los Angeles. Heavyweight, colored, Denver, Ed Martin, Denver. Light heavyweight, George Gardner, Lowell, Mass. Lowell is an industrial town, probably like 30-minute drive from Boston without traffic. Uh, and then middleweight, Tommy Ryan out of Chicago. Tommy Ryan, fantastic boxer. Welterweight, Joe Walcott. And it says colored of Boston. So there wasn't a colored champ at that weight class because Joe Walcott, Barbados Joe Walcott, he was the champ. So what becomes apparent is like how they how they're describing things, because there are also claims, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit of that. So the lightweight, Joe Gans, the old master Joe Gans, colored from Baltimore. And then at featherweight, William Rothwell, young Corbett. Denver, there have been multiple young Corbetts. Uh, that's one of them, Mr. Rothwell there. And then bantamweight, Harry Forbes of Chicago. So you can see how, like, you hear people say heavyweight was the marquee division. It really was. So the baddest man on the planet type thing. So Jeffries was the champ and Denver Ed Martin had actually won the belt in 02. Actually, let me go over here, pull up, pull up a couple graphics. I'm not going super heavy into the graphics this morning. I just wanted to chat a little bit. Here we go. So pugilism, this is from the, I think it's late December, 1902. Two boxing champions were dethroned in the year 1902. Frank, I don't know if that's Ern or Ernie. I'll say, I'll say Ernie, but forgive me if I make a mistake there. A lot of these names I read more than I hear. Frank Ernie, the leader of the lightweights, lowered his colors to Joe Gans, the colored pugilist. And Frank Childs passed the colored heavyweight title to Denver Ed Martin. In all other divisions, the titles are held by the same men who possessed them a year ago. The year just closing has been a good one in boxing when compared to the season of 1901. Although the game has had many hard knocks, has been driven out of some states and restricted in others, it has come up smiling after every round and looks stronger now than could be expected. The article continues. James J. Jeffries of Los Angeles, champion of the world, champion of the world success defended his title against Rob Fitzsimmons of Brooklyn. That's Ruby Rob, Bob Fitzsimmons. They fought at San Francisco July 25th, and Jeffries knocked Fitzsimmons out in the eighth round. Another notable event was the remarkable showing made in Butte, Montana, December 20th by Jack Monroe, an amateur boxer in a bout with James J. Jeffries, heavyweight champion pugilist of the world. Monroe accomplished the remarkable feat of knocking the champion down. He also gave Jeffries a terrific thumping and stayed four rounds on a wager of $250. And at this time, and leading up into the time, I'm more focused on the early 1900s, Sam Langford, that, you know, it's about to kick in the part, but like this, at this time, there were a lot of wagers, and some of these wagers were just whether or not you could last a certain distance. So if you're overmatched, you think today if someone's overmatched, they just start running, at times, you know, they, were t they could make money. They could put money up on that back in the day and often did. Joe Gans did it a lot, but other guys did too. Bob Fitzsimmons, Mr. Jeffries here. So, and I think there's one more little piece of the article. Yeah, Rothwell, young Corbett of Denver, the featherweight champion, besides fighting several limited bound, round bouts, 
in which no decision was given, fought John Bernstein of New York, Baltimore, Ultima, October 16th. Young Corbett won in seven rounds. He is now matched to fight Terry McGovern. Terry McGovern, that's terrible Terry McGovern, of Brooklyn for, and I think it says a sizable purse, got cropped out. So there was just a whole ton of fights in boxing, but as far as the, the titles, you can see there's very little, even though there were, there were basically boxing bouts just in the U.S. almost every day of the week, every single week, often in multiple cities the same day, all year long. So many that when they review notable bouts in the Boston Post at the end of 1903, he lists like 300 fights, notable fights. Who knows how many off, you know, not on that guy's radar, but there's very little like the championship fights were a big deal. They're held in super high esteem. And that's partly why, say, we're talking about the heavyweight champion specifically. Well, Jeffrey's the champ, but Denver Ed Martin and then Denver Ed Martin would lose it to Jack Johnson. It, you know, they were serious people too. They were legit champs. That was a split title at that time because Jeffries had drawn the color line. So the other, they, they were competing champs at this time. So when people say this guy was undisputed, well, no, he wasn't really, you know, we, it, it's described in those terms a lot of times in documentaries. And even at that time, people would call him the champ, but they wouldn't not call the color champ, the color champ. And then if the champion, the world champion, quote unquote, happened to be colored, they would mention that like with Walcott and Gans here. So it's like when people wouldn't fight each other, when the guys wouldn't cross the, the color line at, at championship level, um, they would often make note of that. So it, by definition, it's a disputed championship. And actually Jack Johnson, you could argue that of the gloved era that he was the first undisputed heavyweight world champion because he was the color champion with a ton of defenses and he beat he beat the world champ at that time tommy burns aka noah brusso is his real name of a canadian of italian descent but he beat him for the world title but then he also beat the lineal champion jeffries who had retired in 1905 i believe it was so jeffries wouldn't fight jack johnson when Jack Johnson had won the color title. So he was the competing champ. Jeffries retired. Actually, let me pull up a couple graphics here. I didn't go heavy on the graphics, but I hope everyone listening is having a fantastic day. This, this wasn't very, I sort of improv this about an hour ago. I was like, you know what? I should talk about this a bit. So let's see. So here's Jeffries and Johnson. Jeffries won't fight. Johnson, they're both, they're both world champs. The white champ, which they often just called the champ, but there's the color world champ right there, Jack Johnson. Both powerful fighters. They did eventually fight, but they didn't fight prime versus prime. They more fought when Johnson was still in his prime and then Jeffries was he, far past it. He got into good shape, all things considered, but he wasn't in good enough shape to take on Johnson at that point and have it be very competitive, even though he was a big guy. So here's, so when Jeffries retires in 1905, right? So he's one of the two champs. He retires and Jack Root, who has an Eastern European actual name, I just can't remember it. I've been up all night working. But Jack Root, Jack Root fights Marvin Hart. Marvin Hart on the right there takes the world title in his very next fight. I'm pretty sure I have one for the next fight too. In his very next fight, Marvin Hart loses to Tommy Burns on the left there. So Mr. Brusso goes on a little run, has a lot of title fights. That was, I think, in 1906. So in 1905, they crowned the new champ. 1906, Hart loses to Tommy Burns. Tommy Burns, now the champ, he has a bunch of fights between then and the end of 1908 when he fights and loses horribly to Jack Johnson. Now at that point, Jack Johnson is actually the undisputed champ. He's actually unified the two lineages, the color line that prevented this at heavyweight. You know, it had happened down at other weights. You had Joe Walcott and Joe Gans. 
And when Joe Gans was a champ, I've seen in the papers, they would, they would, they would build fights for the white champ at lightweight and welterweight when, when Gans and Walcott were holding the world titles. And there were all, there's all kinds of crazy stuff regarding that and different claims and jurisdictions. And I'm going to get into that on the full project. This is just, this is just me ranting for a little bit. So 1908, by the end of 1908, Jack Johnson is the undisputed heavyweight world champ, arguably the first, at least in the club there. And his top contender is Sam Langford. But unfortunately, Johnson, though he had signed a contract to, he was he could make way more money. So he he fought some other guys. He didn't fight Langford. And he had already fought him once in 1906, but Langford had put on a little bit of weight and certainly gained a lot of experience in those two years. Langford fought a crazy, crazy schedule. So Johnson won't fight Langford. So even though he's he's become undisputed, he was undisputed until I think 1909. Langford, I think, claimed it. I think he beat Klondike Haynes or somebody. And there might have been other guys at the same time making the claim, Jeanette McVeigh and other these other great fighters who were barred, you know, from that world title shot, even after Johnson unified the lineages and became un- actually undisputed. He then fought a bunch of other guys, and, the, and then the history repeated, unfortunately. And so Langford, Jeanette, McVeigh, and some other guys, they all fought each other for the colored belts. I mean, for the colored heavyweight title. Now, but also, you could also say, because Johnson didn't fight the lineal champ, so Jeffries had retired. So in this enormous fight, after dancing, you know, after beating some beatable guys, at least compared to Johnson's abilities at that time, I think it was 1910, Johnson has the fight with the lineal champ. He comes out of retirement, loses 100 pounds, and he lose, slims down to upper two-somethings or other. Probably slim down to 250, 260, I'm not actually sure. And that absolutely schools him in a big money fight. So at that point, he's now beaten the lineal champ and he beat the, the reigning world champ, Tommy Burns. So, but you can't really call him undisputed at this point because he won't fight. There's a new colored championship lineage at heavyweight. Sam Langford, McVeigh, Jeanette, Haynes, battling Jim Johnson. Other guys are fighting for a competing belt. So Johnson, although he was, it's sort of ironic, you know, even though he became actually by definition undisputed, it was only for a matter of months, you know, less than a year because he wouldn't defend his color title. Other people made that claim that then became established that there was another lineage. So, and then after, unfortunately after Johnson, you know, Willard was a, a useless champ, an inactive champ, I should say. Dempsey became an inactive champ. And, the, you know, all the way down to the great Joe Lewis, you didn't have that. You didn't get the best versus the best in the championship lineages intertwining again until Joe Lewis. And then Joe Lewis had a phenomenal reign. But So, you know, Johnson was like a, a spark. But unfortunately, the because he could make the money fighting the White Hopes, some of whom had already lost to his fellow colored heavyweights. You know, they weren't, you know, if you look at like Tony Ross, should that guy have gotten a title shot over? No, I mean, he would have been, I don't even know what he would have been ranked. If there were rankings at that time, he would have been way, way low. But it was just a money fight. But hold on, let's see, we got a comment here. Oh, thanks, Scrap. So it's like, you know, so, and this is not to put Johnson down at all. Johnson was a fantastic fighter, one of the all-time greats, and also one of the most talented and gifted fighters, not just great resume, great achievements, the ability to beat large or smaller guys. You know, he could compete against speed. He could also compete against size and power. He was brilliant. But he perpetuated the pattern, unfortunately. Although I give him credit, though, he was actually undisputed. I wouldn't say that about Jeffries because there was another champion out there wanting to fight him and he, he wouldn't do it. And that's true of other champions. You know, Scrap, I'm sure you could, you know, that you've been doing your excellent series these last couple of days on 
you know, the contenders, the, the murderers row lineups and their schedules, which I really enjoyed. I loved just loving hearing about the text of it, even though there was a lot of unf to celebrate what was done in a martial arts sense, separate from like if people were robbed of certain opportunities, but they, they often did a great deal of like incredible and admirable martial arts competition in spite of not, you know, because there were people who robbed opportunities who didn't do much. We don't really celebrate them as much. They just, but other these other guys overcome that adversity and still have terrific careers. So, so Johnson did attain that, but then he didn't maintain it. And so you get to the point where in 1909, there's now two champs again. And he goes back to it. And uh, various people did manage to to get it, Langford had, to my understanding, had five championship reigns at heavyweight um, for the color, you know, color title reigns. But other other people, you know, held it to overtime. They just, uh, you know, so I guess the project I'm going to do, I'm going to actually go in pretty deep, and uh, those clippings I showed earlier, those are just, that's just a taste of what I'll get what I'll eventually get to, but the, the actual process of of acquiring the clippings takes a while, like as far as to get them formatted and everything. But Jack Johnson, you know, people say, oh, 1908, Jack Johnson became world champ. Well, you know, he actually did that in 1903 when he took it off Denver Ed Martin. He took one of the lineages over from Denver Ed Martin. And then he held that from 03 all the way till 1908, when he unified the colored title with the, the establishment title, we say. And that's pretty epic. And he, he wasn't the only, only quote-unquote colored fighter, non-white fighter, to, to basically become the guy. But at heavyweight, that was different. Because culturally, you're talking about, you know, all the other weight classes are to give the smaller guys a chance. If you talk about the original conception, it's like, open weight is heavyweight it's just everyone fight each other right so then you you have middleweight and lightweight this is so the smaller people will have a chance and won't just get crushed and not even be able to participate like barbados walcott one of the great pound for pound fighters of all time you know he was the well he was the welterweight champion but when he uh and he'd fight up the weights even heavyweights but joe walcott in 1904 he fought sam langford 15 rounds to a draw. Like, this is when the great Sam Langford was just coming up. He had beaten Joe Gans, the great, the great lightweight of that era, the, at the end of the year before, and then halfway through 1904, Langford fights Walcott, 15 rounds to a draw. Walcott fought Joe Gans at welterweight, although it ended up being non-title, but they, they weighed in at 142. But they, uh, they fought 20 rounds to a draw, but then a few weeks after that, Walcott shot himself in the hand. And then all different people started making welterweight claims. And then it was chaos. And he came back a couple of years later. He wasn't quite the same, but he did come back. But it was interesting to see all the different claims and things that happened. Because before, in the lead up to him fighting Walcott, there was some tasty stuff going on at welterweight. All kinds of guys were calling out, not just Walcott and then Gans, seeing as he was going to actually fight at title level at welterweight, he was moving up. But there were a bunch of other guys calling to fight both of them and also to fight Langford and fight Dave Holly. And so there were a bunch of calls. It's interesting to see, how, considering how ducked he became. There was a time in like 1904, Langford, tons of people wanted to fight him. He was the hot new, the new hotness. But then what happened was he kept getting better and better and winning against bigger and bigger guys. And then the guys his own size pretty much they noped out of it. They weren't as interested. But there is a rich title lineage outside of the establishment belts. Those color titles were hotly contested. In fact, you know, Langford was much, much smaller at the time, but he, you know, he challenged Johnson for the the colored heavyweight title when he, he was walking around under the middleweight limit of the day. Actually, that's something else I should mention. So I got an upcoming countdown with, um, I started to do a graphic. It's not actually finished, but 
I'll throw it a head up. We're going to count down the, our top 10 greatest middleweights of all time with no set criteria, just however we want to do it. I've been trying to figure out what part of Langford's career counts. I would count him as a middleweight so I can compare him to some of these other resumes. Because Langford didn't spend that many years. The way I have it, uh, he comes in above, you know, far enough above Welter. I don't think he'd be making Welter anymore in early no in uh, February '05 against Dave Holly. I think he came like 150 something. And then the last time I can find him coming close to middleweight, he came in at 161 pounds against the great Sam McVeigh in one of, in their fight in Paris at the end of 1911. And that's the last time I've found, I've personally so far been able to find Langford being even close to what we would call middleweight now. Middleweight used to be a little bit lower, but to compare across eras, I'm just kind of, I'm using 160 as a sort of a baseline. So the, the last time I can find Langford coming in, at least so far, coming in close to 160, was 161 against McVeigh, who was over 200 pounds, which is crazy. You know, he gave up like 40 pounds to one of the biggest knockout punches of his era, Sam McVeigh, and went 20 rounds. Quite incredible. So that, but that lineage that, so this, so I guess uh, that only came up because Langford, most of his work was at heavyweight, but he was fighting at heavyweight when he was a middleweight. Like when he was literally like at the end of a, a training camp, he wouldn't even weigh the middleweight limit. Sometimes he blew up a little bit. One of his fights against Joe Jeanette in that stretch between February 05 and, and, uh, 1911, in that stretch, one of the fights against McVeigh, I mean, against Joe Jeanette, who was 200 pounds for the fight, he, he's listed at 175. But then after that, a while after that, he comes in at 161. Absolute super fighting shape against McVeigh. So so it's difficult to sort of like place his um, exactly what I would call middleweight. So I figure if it's in that span when he can make middleweight easily, like, and he's also fighting middleweights, there's evidence at least of him, of him still being able to be a middleweight. You know, he's fighting heavyweight hall of famers, light heavyweights and other great middleweights as a middleweight. Like not a, he didn't get big. Oh, thanks. Scrap. Yes, Scrap. I'm excited about this thing. Uh, I've been doing quite a bit of quite a bit of research to try and get um, get my middleweights down because there are guys I hadn't really considered that have been brought up like you can see there in the upper left Jeff Smith right there I can throw his face up there but also like how do I how would I go about rating Ruby Rob Bob Fitzsimmons right there in the middle because he doesn't have as large a middleweight resume as others but while he was a middleweight, like Langford, he fought some big fellas and kept his power as a middleweight, fighting, just giving up dramatic size to certain people. So in my personal criteria scrap, I'm like I'm counting that heavily. You get bonus points for that if you can actually still be down at the at the middleweight limit like you're you you are a middleweight but you're winning up at light heavier heavyweight guys like Langford, Fitz, Greb. It's incredible. I count that heavily. Heck yeah, you see? You know what's up. Because if you just go on the size of a resume like Bob Fitzsimmons, you know, there are plenty of guys who have like a, more fights at middleweight. But they don't have knockouts at heavyweight as a middleweight. Langford fits. They do. And Greb, he wasn't he didn't have as much stopping power, but he schooled a lot of heavyweights while he was a middleweight. And he was so busy, he might have just fought he wasn't like bulking up 
because he might have fought eight days earlier at middleweight. Then he just goes fights a light heavyweight. Then he fights another middleweight. Then he goes and fights a heavyweight. Like he wasn't putting on the pounds to do it. So I'm counting that for my list. Scrap, I'm counting that heavily. Bonus points. Even though you can look at some like some great fighters like Monzone and Hagler, Hopkins, these guys went on long runs. They they put a lot of numbers up and accomplishments specifically at that weight. But I you know, size counts. You know, yeah, it's incredible. These guys can easily make because, like, you know, Langford, like that fight with Jeanette, he came in at 175, Jeanette to Jeanette's 200. But, you know, it wasn't that many much time later where there's evidence of him coming in much, much lighter. So these guys did cut weight. Like, it wasn't, it's just they, today they have like better understanding of how to cut weight and rehydrate and stuff so guys can make some much more severe weight cuts and still perform to some degree but you know guys did take off weight to fight but but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were overly large to start with so like joe gans was fighting at 130 you know he he pretty much wanted to fight people 136 pounds at ringside especially if there's any kind of title at stake. He fights some larger guys under different conditions, but 136 or 138 sometimes, like with Langford, who's supposed to be 138. Langford could only make 140, so it was a non-title fight. But Gans, when he fought Walcott, you know, he was fighting at lightweight, and then he just didn't shed as much water weight. And he, he made 142, even though he was he, he could easily make 136. But he came in at 142. He was losing a little bit of weight for his fights, sweating it out a little or something. The same with Langford. You know, it's guys' weights fluctuate. But Langford, after he fought Stanley Catchell, I think, you know, and then not long after that, Catchell was murdered. So he beat he beat the dominant middleweight of his era. Over six rounds, he got the best from over six rounds. Seven papers, newspapers had it for him, and four newspapers had it for Ketchel. I think one paper had a draw. But he beat that guy over six rounds. They were supposed to have a big fight on the over on the other coast, on the West Coast. I think for 25 rounds, Ketchel was murdered, and then all kinds of people started claiming middleweight title, title credit, but then a lot of them would, were drawing the the line they were gonna they were gonna lock him out so i think at that point langford just focused on heavyweight he didn't i don't see like he came in low from mcveigh but that must have been more to get his speed and conditioning because in australia because i mean it's, uh, sorry for the paris fight before their series in australia but it was 161 at that point but then after that he's coming in over at 170 or higher in all the places i've been able to find so fitting his, because he has such a giant heavyweight resume, well, for this countdown scrap, a lot of his heavyweight resume, or at least a decent chunk of it, happened while he was still a middleweight. And so I'm not going to punish him for, I don't give him credit for fights he didn't have, but I'm not going to punish him in the in the way I'm looking at greatness of, of middleweights that a lot of his contemporary middleweights wouldn't fight him. So he was fighting tougher, bigger, dangerous, more dangerous fighters. That's he gets bonus points. There's definitely no penalty for that. But I'm uh, my original point was, but I'm I'm working hard on this. There's a lot of great middleweights, and you know, like this guy right here, Harry Greb, just a whole ton of fights, just a whole ton of fights, and you know, he was. I mean. I wonder how people describe. So I hear people say, okay, he's a career middleweight. Well, Greb didn't restrict his performances to middle, the middleweight division, but he was in his frame and his size. He was a career. Like once he got up to middleweight, he was pretty much could make middleweight going all the way out. So, but he was fighting Hall of Fame light heavyweights and he fought a lot of heavyweights, including heavyweight contenders as a, a 
like someone of the size of a career middleweight, I should say. Now, Langford was a little different. He kept growing. So he outgrew, he outgrew middleweight eventually. By like 1912, he wasn't, he didn't go back. He didn't get down there. He got, he filled out probably all the Australian beer. When he went to the series in, in Australia for promoting Hugh McIntosh, he wasn't fighting as often as the previous years since he hadn't had that few fights in a year since 1902. So, so 1912 is a slower year and he's in Australia. He's living it up. He had a, he had his car delivered over there. He was visiting the breweries. There's some great photos of him in the breweries and drinking beer with people. And I think that's why, partly why he put on some weight. And certainly 1913, when he, his, when he fought Gumbo Smith and Gumbo kept him on the end of his jab and got a little bit the best of him. People thought he took lightly, but he came in a little over, overweight for him. But I wonder if that was just his, his year plus in Australia, living it up a bit. But um, so circle back around to bring this back to the original point. Titles have always been really confusing, and but someone like Langford, in the way, like go, looping back to the heavyweight title lineage, he was an important part of it, and it was understood for a long time after, after his after he was you know like a relevant boxer later when he was an old an old guy it was understood that he was he had been something special it wasn't a case of um like people generating something that that didn't exist at the time just like with the heavyweight title like if i see in the paper they're like here's the colored world champ i'm like okay so that's what it actually was so to me that's what it is i'm not I'm not rewriting anything. I'm trying to ascertain the reality of the day. But like Joe Lewis down there in the bottom left, standing with an older Langford, you know, Lewis knew what was up. Lewis's coach, Jack Blackburn, Hall of Fame trainer, but also just a, a Hall of Fame level fighter, one of the greats. Um, in the top left there, wrapping Joe Lewis's hands, he came from Langford's era. He knew what was up. You know, and he didn't he didn't get any title shots, colored or otherwise, that I'm aware of. Blackburn, although he did fight the great Joe Gans and got the best of him over six rounds in a non title fight. Got this got the best of Langford in a prearranged draw that same year, a few weeks later. So I mean Blackburn was a Hall of Fame level fighter. I don't think he got title shots, but you know, Lewis getting one at heavyweight was monumental because no one had gotten one since Jack Johnson. But like Lewis and Blackburn, they knew what Langford had been. The bottom right there is Joe Lewis, Tony Canzanieri, Langford, and older Langford. These guys knew he had been something extra special. And that's why when they, you know, when the International Boxing Hall of Fame, that's why he was in there. Pretty sure year one, and they was like, yeah, you got to have that guy in there. But it's a shame in a way to hear. It's just, I guess it's a shame in a way to hear people talk about world titles and when they get back this far. It's also distant and it was kind of complicated and it certainly wasn't. There wasn't a whole lot of undisputed going around. And most of the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time, there were two belts in that early era. Sometimes more. As far as claims, especially like when Walcott... Like when Stanley Catcher was murdered, but also when Walcott shot himself in the hand. You know, people just start making claims. They do sort it out eventually, but in the pre-ratings era, they it took a while sometimes for it to be accepted. Just like, you know, part of the reason Johnson Jeffries was such a huge mega fight was because Jeffries had retired without losing that title. So I guess I should pull, try and pull those up again. So that, so that lineage had been sort of severed. So you had Jeffries. Okay, cool. You know, he's, he ducks out in 05. Why can't I find it? Oh, yeah, so Root and Hart fight. So Hart wins. 
loses his very next fight to Tommy Burns. Tommy Burns does a, a spurt between 06 and um and 08, and then in, in 08 he loses it to Johnson. But Jeffrey still hasn't lost, you know what I mean? Johnson had taken the, the colored heavyweight title from Dan Van Martin there, who's on the right. So it wasn't until that mega fight between Johnson and Jeffries that they actually, the lineal title, you could say, was unified. But by then, Langford had become, you know, won and held the, the colored heavyweight title that Johnson used to hold and defend. So really to unify it, these guys needed to fight right here. And at certain times when other people had taken it before Langford had gotten it back, they they should have been fighting. But Johnson was off fighting guys like Jack O'Brien, Tony Ross, Al Kaufman. Not necessarily bad fighters, but he certainly wasn't trying to get what today we would we would want to call undisputed. Instagram. Yeah, I guess at the time, was he 154, was it, or 156? So at the time, that would have been just a smidge over. I know that, see, the weights are, that's another thing I'll have to get into in the in the detailed live streams, the, um, the claims at different weights. They were, and sometimes, you know, titles would be contested above the weight the title was for. Sometimes to ridicule from the press, where they'd be like, oh, well, he's winning here for the title, but he's really already in this other weight class. Always been complicated. It's a lot of fun to research, but it's definitely, it gets convoluted. But my original point, the reason I wanted to originally jump on was just to, to mention that Johnson became actually undisputed, and then within a year, it was disputed again. Because he wouldn't fight everybody, just like the guys who would shut him out for years from 03 to till the end of 08. He was shut out. He was the colored heavyweight champ. But then from, from 08 to 1915, when he lost it to Jess Willard, he was doing that same thing. Although he did fight the lineal champ and did take that, but there was another belt out there. It's so just interesting how all that plays out. Here's the great Joe Gans when he was the lightweight champ. Um, there were colored lightweight champions. There were people fighting for colored belts. I saw in the paper the family of one of the guys in California was holding it. I can't remember which of the fighters it was had the thing, and then Gans was going to go out to California and challenge him. And they said, well, if you come out here, we're going to use our family connections to get, you know, uh, boxing bouts between, you know, interracial boxing bouts banned in, in the state. They ended up fighting. I think actually the guy lost to someone else and then Gans fought him to uni sort of unify those claims. You know, there's like the titles, but there's also a lot of claims going on. Back in the day when they fought so much, they could just go ahead and dance around a bit. But then when someone came up with a big enough purse, they go ahead and settle that claim. And Gans and Walcott and some of these guys did get the opportunity to do that, to like to actually become the guy. Like when Joe Walcott was the man, yeah, people can make other claims, but he was so much the man. You know, they kind of noted in the papers that there were a lot of guys his own size that didn't fancy a go with him and that he would campaign up even at heavyweight. So talk about being the dominant guy at your weight. Not a, you know, Langford did that later in a similar way. The guys his own size weren't that keen. Even if they were among the best in the world at his own weight, they weren't they weren't really into it. So he just went ahead up and did tremendously well against much, much larger guys than himself. He wasn't the only one to do it. You know, Walcott had done it. Gans did some of it too. Gans would fight over his weight. Langford certainly fought above his weight. Tiger Flowers, you know, Joe Jeanette gave up weight. He wasn't as small as Langford, but he gave up weight in a lot of fights too. Lots of great fighters and had to do, you know, I guess at that time because of the dynamic, a lot of the colored boxers had to do more either to get paid, to get purses or things like that, or to get proper attention or to be considered notable. There were guys with very few fights 
who were treated at times, at times at least, as more notable. With this countdown scrap that we're doing, uh, you know, notability as far as like their fame has nothing to do with you know, how I'm ra rating them against each other. I'm just thinking in terms of martial arts. And uh, just to, trying to trying to find a balance in how I'm weighing them against each other, because you have like epic world title wins, losses, recaptures, and just this amazing thing that someone like Sugar Ray Robinson. You have like long dominations, you know, like Hagler, Monzone, Hopkins. Then you have like the furious schedule multi-weight craziness of the great Harry Greb, which is just, it's hard to even sum up how, because his career is so big. But the part of his career where he was fighting regularly at middleweight is insane. It really is. But how do you compare that directly to someone, because he didn't win the title until he was long past his best. So how do you compare that to someone like Robinson, who's all about some titles? Or say a Stanley Catchell who did remarkably well even fighting above his weight, but then died young. He was absolutely great. And he has a great resume, but would be even more epic. Lots of guys to balance off each other. Like I said earlier, Ruby Rob, you know, one of the hardest punches for a man of size to ever live. He was like Langford. They were cut from that same cloth. And the newspapers suggested that, that Langford was the hardest hitter since Fitz. Neither of these guys were big guys. When they were middleweights, they were ferocious. And Ketchell, too. Ketchell was a vicious puncher. Pretty crazy stuff. Incredibly crazy stuff. You know, being a puncher is not just about being big. You know, there's Joe Lewis on the left there. He's second from the left. That's him and his sparring partners getting ready for Primo Carnera. He's smaller than all of those dudes. None of those dudes hit like Joe Lewis, though. Yeah, he was at the right weight in his prime to, to deliver with speed and precision that makes the punch powerful. So I pretty much said what I wanted to say as far as regarding the titles and how it's, it's kind of complicated. So, you know, there's frustrations today. And there are great fights that don't involve, just like then, there are great fights today at heavyweight that don't involve number one and number two. It's just extra special when we get that competing champions figuring out who's the best of the champions, who's the top of all the talent pools. You know, who's Usyk Joshua, too? That's a great fight. I'm not sure what Fury's going to do. Wilder's indicated he's still fighting, so... You know, I think Ruiz has a fight coming up. Just a lot of good stuff going on. And it's complicated today, but it was it was always pretty complicated. And if you look back until Joe Lewis, until Joe Lewis and who just was just traveled around the country just kicking everybody's butt. But until then, you only had just a brief flash of undisputed technically from Jack Johnson late nineteen oh eight. Till sometime in 1909, when Langford basically claimed the claimed the color championship, I think it was against Klondike Haynes. But if I'm not mistaken, there were other fights that where the claim was made, and it all it all unified over time. For some reason, I'm thinking Jeanette and McVeigh. I don't know. I have to go. I have to go and uh, finish the research, do the long talk. But thanks for tuning in. Be ranting about this. Definitely keep an eye open for our top 10 greatest middleweights countdown. But I'm going to come back in as far as um, just talking about how complicated the title claims got. Even this graphic right here, that throws a wrinkle in how people talk about it. Like, oh, snap, look, there's two, there's two heavyweight champs. So credit to, credit to all of them. These are all, you know, there are people who, who drew the color line at time, or either all the time or at times who still had great resumes, just like there are, there are colored boxers who were shut out from fighting a lot of the great white fighters of the day, still built great resumes. Best case scenario is you fight everybody. But there were fighters that 
at times were locked out or circumstances denied them things that still did great things. That's true of Langford and Jack Johnson, which is ironic because then the whole thing between them from 08 to 15, dancing around, Johnson not really wanting it, but Johnson went through it. There were a lot of fighters that didn't want any part of Jack Johnson, just like it became with Langford and, and Harry Wills too. You know, So credit to the people who did fight him. But really, the, the monumental nature of the great Joe Lewis title reign years after those guys were done, it's hard to overstate how epic he was and how epic it was, like why a lot of people considered him the greatest ever. Because he, here's a big man who is the, he's the guy. Whereas you had a flash of it with Johnson, but there was always like some sort of dispute. Rivals, you know, Dempsey, as great as he was, and he's remembered as such an all-time great. He was a great fighter, but he embarrassed himself avoiding Harry Wills. You know, so like Bob Fitzsimmons said, you know, if you want to be the best, you fight everybody. And a lot of guys didn't live up to that, but there's certainly there's certainly a reason some fighters deserve a lot of sustained praise and credit. I think I might get off for a while now. I've been on for 45 minutes. I did this last time. I said, I'm going to get off. And then someone commented and I stayed on another like hour and three quarters. What the heck? I'm definitely going to have um, have a hard time. This is just some of the middleweights under consideration for that countdown. But so I'm doing, while I'm doing that, I've got some other projects coming up. I'm going to be definitely getting more information about, about the complexity of the title claims. Because in a perfect world, Johnson would have won the heavyweight title, fought Lang for the other top guys. And then the winner of all those matchups, if Jeffries came out to fight them, you'd have actual actual, factual, lineal, undisputed. But as it was, you know, Johnson unified the lineages and then he split them back apart again. Oh, thanks, Scrap. I've been awake for a million years, so I, I don't know if I'm rambling, but I've been looking, I was going through my clip archives, my clippings, and trying to figure out what more I would need to format, to, to do a proper talk on this, on this, on how comp one, how much boxing was going on compared to how many titles there were. Because it's not like people fought at the pace of today, except there are only one or two at most titles in each weight class. No, no, no. It's like people had, you know, five times the busyness a lot of time. It wasn't unusual to be five times as busy or four times as busy as the boxers of today. And there were maybe a, a quarter or of the titles in the weight classes they did have, and then a lot of weight classes they just didn't have at that time. So it's just a remarkable ratio of fights to championship opportunities, which is why the, the regional titles meant so much. Like when Greb fought, Gene Tunney gave him his only career loss. That was for like the America's light heavyweight title. That's one of the great collisions. You know, Greb was this machine of this crazy thing and Tony was undefeated with a lot of experience himself so it's a big deal Tony went on to do other great things so did Greb but that was for a regional title although of course in those days America was the spot not just Americans you had a lot of people of you know immigrant children or born in other countries who just took anglicized names so people don't realize their they, that their real name is not what they're fighting under. I should probably do a talk on that. I got a, I got a couple cool clippings to talk about people's, you know, their fighter name and their real name. Like Stanley Catchell, his real name wasn't Stanley. Jack Root's real name wasn't Jack Root. You know, like these, these guys have Eastern European names. There are people who took a different name in tribute or because they thought it sounded cool or helped them promote, but there are people who just straight up anglicized their names so that 
you know, because I guess as they transition from the age of the Irish fighter, there was a time when a lot of the prominent fighters are Irish, so people would take sort of maybe an Irish sound name easier to get booked. But all that diff all that different stuff changed over time. But a lot of fighters, the way they're remembered is not not for their their birth name. Just how it is. You know, like Tommy Burns, Tommy Burns. You know, his name was Noah Brusso. He's Italian. Oh, I think he was born in I don't know if he was born in Canada or born in Italy, but he's of Italian descent. But Tommy Burns sounds that sounds pretty Irish, right? Like, sounds pretty like waspy. Thunderbolt, Harry Smith. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. I have a clipping. I have a good picture of him. I found the paper. I have to dig that up too, Scrap. Yeah, and Scrap, uh, you know, if you want to send, you don't have to send me your list, but if you want to send me like a list of names, like a longer, than, more than 10, just a bunch of middleweight names to make sure I have graphics for, I have BL doing the same thing. I'm going to run a list by him and he's just going to tell me if there's others I should add. I think I'm going to go all out because I think we're going to have a lot of people that come up in conversation, even if they're not necessarily making the list. Yeah, will do. Let me know any others. You can mix in some guys that aren't on your list just so that you're not giving away your list. That's cool. Like on that graphic I made, I had Jeff Smith. I don't know if Jeff Smith makes my top 10. The way I'm looking at it, I mean, what a fantastic fighter. There's middleweight such a story division. The way I'm looking at it, I'm giving a lot of credit to um, a blend of factors. I didn't go by resume this time, although it's informed by resume, but I, I just was trying to be open to, to all the different factors, like what might be considered great. Such a broad term. So I'm definitely enjoying the, the latitude where I can I'm not just going who has the best middleweight resume of all time or any set criteria. Everyone has their own blend, but I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm definitely going to, I'm aiming to have about 40 to 50 at least middleweights with graphics for them so that whoever might make the list from all of these decades of, of boxing, I'll have a graphic for them. That's um, that's quite a project. And this this other one is actually going to be pretty epic. Like, cause I have a ton, hundreds and hundreds of newspaper clippings, and so I have to go through the ones that relate to the schedule. You know, as it pertains to like say heavyweight title fights and colored heavyweight title fights. Yeah, that's what's up. Scrap. We don't need a. We don't, I respect you and BL enough. You don't have to have any kind of criteria. You can just say, I think this, this is what greatness means to me. Well, I'm like, okay, I respect that. I got my, you know, I'm going, I'm basically going by glow. <laughs> I'm serious, brother. I'm going by glow. When I think about all the factors, does it make me glow? That feeling that, that, what do they call it? Goosebumps, chicken skin. That like, holy crap, that's incredible. And that's why weight jumping, I count it so much. Fitz, Langford, Greb did it. Those guys get mega bonus points. Nick, what's up, man? We got random acoustic thoughts, scrapbooking, savior. Okay, great to see you, my friend. Thanks for, thanks for dropping the encouragement. That's always great. It's funny, I often in these things, I talk for 45 minutes. And then as I'm getting ready to finish, everything cranks up. But it's just nice to talk about talk about this history. You're absolutely you're absolutely right, scrapbook. Uh, you know, we can we can certainly have a fun conversation. Some people will learn some things. You know, other people it might like. I know we got a little piece of feedback on our. Top 10 heavyweights of 1900 and 1925, but can't make, you know, can't make everyone happy all the time. And this kind of list is very subjective. So I like that we're not doing criteria because then it allows us to discuss why we 
picked the guys we did. And there are a lot of great fighters who aren't going to make any of our top tens because it's just new. Great. There are still great fighters who won't make it. Just too many. It's the truth, Scrap. But also, there's no need to, you know, people, because people have the option. They have the option to do their own thing. The people who like this kind of stuff, they really like it. And that's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about enthusiasm, not numbers. Just like as I'm trying to rate these great, how great these various middleweights are, I'm not thinking about how popular they were. Although I might give credit to someone like Fitz, who was doing a lot of exhibitions. He was being an ambassador to, for boxing. I don't know if I would count that toward this kind of greatness, but certainly there's a certain fighters, their notoriety, like what they do with their notability, you could call great. Fitz was one of those guys who really did a lot to present the sport of boxing as you know, the manly art. And he was, he wasn't just fighting a lot, fighting above his weight. You know, he was actually an ambassador for the sport. Some of these guys do that more than others. Maybe maybe you or BL or myself, maybe we'll get a little bit of that romanticism mixed in with the with the resume analysis. I mean, that's cool with me. I just like hearing the stories. Like especially some of these fighters where they face setbacks and they come back and they, they don't just crumble. So a lot of the modern boxers they fight. You know, they try to hit their prime before they get their giant steps up, and then they fight, and they they kind of run out of time. So by the time they are losing, they they've left their prime, and they just kind of retire with their money, which is cool. But some of these fighters face setbacks and then came back and overcame those hurdles, and they had time because they were so busy. But others like Fitz, like he wasn't as busy as other guys, strictly in professional fights. But if you look at his exhibitions and his basically his challenge matches i saw a great article he was visiting chicago and he was going to fight three guys in the same night but one of the guys wrote into the paper to beg out of the contest he said basically said my manager said it wouldn't be good for my image or my health <laughs> but like i don't know if those would count as professional bouts or if they were it was part of an exhibition and further compliment that is sometimes the way the papers describe something they'd say that's a wonderful exhibition of boxing meaning the skills on display not necessarily that it wasn't for money or for bets certainly studying gets it's rather complex but it's a lot of fun to a lot of fun to try and this one's going to be a beast the other one the the one i did with with BL, the five years, top five years of Langford, that was tough. When we did, when the three of us did the top five years of Greb, that was extremely tough. But this is going to blow them all away. This is going to be so, so difficult. Not difficult, just challenging and involved. I can tell you one thing, like when we're talking about middleweights and guys who can make middleweight and how great they are, right? And like this, Langford succeeds, Fitz is the hardest hitter. Many ring experts believe Langford is the hardest hitter in the world, not accepting Jack Johnson. Yo, this was this article's from a time when Langford was like weighed 160 something to 170 something, somewhere in that range. And Fitz was considered the hardest hitter in the world when he was in that same weight range. Now, this is a time when there are some big fellas. Like Langford might have fought McVeigh at 161. McVeigh was 40 pounds heavier and a knockout artist. But they weren't, you know, so that shows you technique and toughness, bone density, and just a whole bunch of kinetic link. And there's a whole bunch of things that go into hard hitting. Guys with exceptional technique can hit harder than big guys who don't, they don't deliver the same, with the same thing. So I respect that, and that's definitely going to earn some points. Oh, that's a good idea, Scrap. 
great middleweights and toward the end she was our most appreciated. Hey, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Yeah, because there are guys where that would let us give a shout to fighters where can't necessarily put them on the list of greatness over the other guys, but there's something about them that's remarkable that deserves a shout. If that's what you mean, I'm totally down for it, brother. Oh, man, I finished my coffee a while ago. I'm, oh, I'm so dry. Yeah, but I really like that idea. I'll run that by BL. I'm sure he won't mind. He could, do, he could probably shout out. You guys could probably shout out 20 each just off the top of your head. My pool is pretty big, although I have, I'm pretty comfortable in my top eight now. Not necessarily the order. I'm still figuring it all out. But I got time to figure it out. At some point, we'd have to do welterweight, I suppose, possibly. That's going to be tough because Walcott, you know, there are guys who are well to, who are excellent at the weight, but they do more. Sometimes they do more before they're actually big enough. Like from my understanding, Walk, you know, Walcott's not the only one, but I think Sugar Ray Robinson, when he was killer welterweight, he started fighting at middleweight as a small middleweight while he was still ranked and competing as a welterweight. I'm assuming that was the transition. So he would be ranked because this is a busy fight era, so they could, he would be ranked when he moved up divisions. He wouldn't move up and then have to earn a ranking. He was already fighting up there. It's definitely going to count a lot, at least for me, when they make my list. When we do welterweight, it's going to be tough because there's so many great fighters who've had dominant times at welterweight, but there aren't that many guys who fight heavyweights while they're still welterweights, like, like Walcott here even if they have more accolades at the weight. You get cornered into a popular decision. Yeah, that's so funny. That's exactly it, right? Yeah, because there are guys who I appreciate immensely. They just, they're just others that I hold higher. That's probably true of all of us. Camille Griffith, he did that. He fought up while he was still not. Obviously, Hank Armstrong. You know, some of these guys, Joe Walk, um, Joe Gans, some of these guys, Langford especially, they, yeah, they fight up. Tiger Flowers, seen some great articles on him doing it. They're saying he, he's doing it like Gans and uh, Langford. This was afterwards, they were saying. And then the, the papers, they gave great credit to that. And they, they gave the reason why. They said when some of these great colored fighters, they can't find people their own weight willing to face them, so they fight up the weights. They held that in high esteem in that day. You know, they didn't call Joe Walcott the Barbados Wonder randomly. He was incredible. And Langford, the Boston Terror, Boston Bone Crusher, all these different names that Langford acquired over his career. That was for good reasons. These guys were scary past their poundage. They were just scary. Like, however big you were, people would think twice. Langford's one of the best examples of it because he did it so much. Guys like Walcott, Gans, Flowers, Greb. There are a lot of great fighters who walk, or Mickey Walker, a lot of great fighters who would give up those pounds. I wouldn't, I wouldn't cry about it. He would just do it. Including uh, up in the top right there, George Byers, second from the second from the right on the top row. You know he was a colored middleweight champ, but he also won the colored heavyweight championship. To his right's Bob Armstrong, who was a colored heavyweight champ. He was tall and he was a big guy, but he was in his fight prime. He wasn't that that heavy. In fact, Joe Lewis in his time he wasn't that he wasn't that heavy himself. Later in his career, he put on weight, but. It's normal for fighters to get heavy, and some of the great ones, they can adapt to that size differential in their own bodies as well as their opponents. Like, as they get heavier, they slow down, maybe. But weight jumping is nothing new. George Byers, at least to my understanding, I think he was the first two-weight color champion. And then Langford did it. Let's see what
Oh, Joe Walcott. That came from 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 his amateur reign and when he was doing the wrestling because he, he did like more mixed rule stuff as well, right? The Barbados Wonder. I do like seeing some of the guys. They're, they're more savory nicknames because in the papers, man, a lot of guys end up getting called like this and that demon. Like if they're black fighter, like they give them a, like a, their city and then the demon. Or they'll just say the black demon from fill in the blank, you know, fill in from the city. And I'm like, come on, guys, you gotta, you gotta cast it in those terms. So the Barbados Wonder is one of my favorite nicknames. Like with Harry Wills, you know, where he was the Brown Panther. In the early reports of Wills, at least from what I've seen, he was the Brown Panther. And then later, people call him the Black Panther. But some of the things like that gets a little bit. A bit unsavory. Some of the descriptions, some of the ways that people are depicted in cartoons or the derisive language that they, they'd be subjected to, even in articles that were giving them great credit. It's unfortunate. But it's what it was, you know, it's not like you know, I'd rather I'd rather study it as it was and understand how everything was in these times and have some wishy-washy like false conception of of what was actually happening so even though it's a little bit uncomfortable at times like you know reading the language and realizing what's happening in terms of taking digs at people or, or dismissing them while sometimes while praising them or just like not giving just not giving them their full complete respect all the time. There are guys who would do it, but there are a lot of guys who would they were always cast it in these terms of sort of derisiveness. But but in the sport at this time, lots of guys did fight across racial lines. Sometimes the title level it was much harder, but there were lots of there were so many fights happening. Tons of guys did fight across racial lines and had epic careers fighting a who's who, fighting everybody. But at times there were guys who weren't, who wouldn't do it, especially at title level, a lot of politics involved. Racial politics, you know, societal race relations, not just the politics of the champ trying to get the most money. A lot of, there were a lot of factors, but the thing that inspired me, inspired me to come on was this. I've had this article for well over a year, but First time I saw it, I was like, huh. Okay. And it's not the only instance, but I, it, because it was, a, I think it was from the Boston Sunday Post, or it might actually, this might have been from a New York paper. Can't quite remember. There's somewhere in, in the northeastern United States, one of these papers reviewing the whole year. I thought it was interesting. I was like, you see that? So they have the, they have, they have championships that aren't aren't disputed or is listed as you know, they they would be undisputed. Gardner, Tommy Ryan, Walcott. Well, I'm not sure if Tommy Ryan would fight across racial lines. I can't remember. I feel like he might have been one of the guys who wasn't wasn't about to cross the lines. You might know that scrap. I can't remember. Still a great fighter, but some of these guys they. At times they duck, they just ducked. And I've even seen where people would draw the racial, draw the color line to get a title shot. Basically, they're telling the white champ, like, "Well, I'm not going to fight black guys, and so if I win the belt, I won't be then putting that title I've won against black dudes." There's a lot of weirdness, you know. It's a weird time, but there are a lot of a lot of the writers. The actual quality of fighting. They gave full credit because it wasn't just them. It wasn't spam. It was like there was a readership. And you're at the fights, and there are powerful people at the fights, and there are also poor, rough and tumble people at fights. A lot of people are betting on these fights. So if you're writing some trash, putting yourself in a position, it's not like today. You just put up on the internet. You know these newspaper men were at these fights. When, you know, so you got to act right. You got to give real credit. I like seeing that in the paper. Unfortunately, though, 
some guys then just have to harp on the race thing too much beyond just mentioning it. They get a little silly. But as far as how well people fight, they were very honest, brutally honest about it. Let's see, got a couple comments. What's up, Bruce? Good morning, sir. Yeah, scrap. I was very, I was, I have a lot of clippings that relate to this, but I don't want to speak too much on them because I don't, I'm concerned I'll get something wrong. I'll misquote myself. I, I do, I, Catch myself starting to talk a bit too far ahead of where I'm at. Thanks for coming by the chat, Bruce. We just, um, if you just joined us, just talking about back in the day, I had mentioned how, um, you know, the heavyweight championship was literally disputed because you know, Jeffries, for instance, wouldn't fight. Well, he wouldn't fight Denver Ed Martin, but then. Dan Van Martin lost it to Jack Johnson. And so in 02, Dan Van Martin won it from Frank Childs, the colored belt, and then lost it to Jack Johnson in 1903. But uh, Jeffries retired in 05. I guess I can recap where I was. And you probably know this stuff, Bruce, but I'm going to show off these graphics I made. <laughs> like Jeffries retired. So, like, okay, so the lineal champ is retired. You know, and Jack Root fights Marvin Hart, and Marvin Hart loses it to Marvin Hart loses it to Tommy Burns. And then a couple, and that's in '06. And then a couple years later, in '08, someone puts up enough money. Tommy Burns gets that thirty grand payday. Loses it to Jack Johnson. So Jack Johnson had been the colored heavyweight champ since 1903. He took it from Denver, Ed Martin, right there. So from 1903 to 1908, Jack Johnson was the colored champ. Tommy Burns from 06 to 08 was the establishment champ, the white champ. But the lineal champ, Jeffries, they would, there was a couple more years after that when they, when they fought. But by then, so Johnson was undisputed very briefly because by 09, Langford was claiming that Colored heavyweight championship because Johnson wouldn't fight him. So Johnson was undisputed for maybe like a year or less. Even though a couple years after he won the, he unified the lineages. Langford was out there as a champ, but he did fight the lineal champ Jeffries and schooled him. But not undisputed at that point. It was literally disputed. You had Sam Langford, the colored heavyweight title from 09 on. They, it had been claimed that people were fighting for it. Johnson wouldn't defend it. So. so even though Johnson beat the lineal champ a couple years after after he won the world title, he was he wasn't he was no longer undisputed. That's the great thing about these busy schedules. These guys got it on. There's lots of fights happening. Whether even if a lot of it's non-title, there was a lot of athletic clubs putting up purses. And putting on these great fights and matchups all over the country, especially this country you know, in the U.S. Trying to figure all the way down to the local level. It's like one of the, one of the ways I'm going to start talking about some of these guys is what class they're in. Like you were saying, high school, oh, class of '95, class of '77, or whatever. It's like Langford was a class of '02, and some of his, you know, where Gans debuted in toward the beginning of the 1890s, but. You know, but by the time Langford fought Gans, he was he was only a year and twenty months into fighting. Or fighting pro. But he was, you know, Langford was a class of O two, Dave Holly, the class of nineteen hundred. And I've been looking at that like the year to year records and then also what year they started. Because sometimes in these early era careers, if they're real busy, you know, if you're ten years into your career, certain guys are just getting going into their absolute peak. But most guys are already trailing off 10 years of fighting because it was a tough schedule. Smaller gloves, longer fights sometimes, harder travel. Yeah, it's the thing too. It's like 
when it was illegal, it was it wasn't even legal in half of the states in the U.S. in 1902. At the end of 1902, I think they said it was legal in 24 states. They're fighting in every state. It's just, uh, you know what I mean? It's just off the books. And you're certainly not going to put it in the paper if you're going to get arrested. And even where it was legal, there were restrictions on bouts or decisions. There was, you know, this time I've been studying that that sort of 1900 to 1905 time period, there was a lot of turmoil. A lot of people were trying to stamp it out, but it was just too cool. Prize fighting is too appealing. Boxing is too freaking cool. They couldn't, they couldn't get rid of it even back then. You know, people, like, I guess it's unfortunate. It's like been like in mixed martial arts, one of the promotions one of the MMA spam points, oh, boxing's dying. Boxing's not dying. Boxing has changed, but boxing survived way more threat than the change from, you know, radio to TV to to pay-per-view to, to streaming services. You know, it's like boxing survived where people are literally like, you can only box for six rounds here. And if no one's knocked out, you're not allowed to award a judge's decision. Police can step in and stop it at any time. They can jump in the ring and tell you what to do. Like, boxing has survived a lot more, quote-unquote, persecution than, than simply diff- different ways of bringing it to the public and different ratios of, like, general public to the paying public availability. We're very blessed these days in what we get to see, but the, the, the richness of this era though it's not documented to the same degree, it was incredible what was being done. It really was. So much so that these incredible feats, some of them get, get drowned out by other incredible feats and it, it slips people, like it just doesn't hit home how crazy some of this stuff is. Like on the left there, there's Sam Langford sparring with Big Bill Tate. Big Bill Tate was gigantic compared to Langford. If you tried to book that fight today, you'd have to do it in Japan or something under mixed rules where they do open weight fights sometimes. But as far as boxing rules, like they wouldn't let him fight, but Langford could put it on guys of that size. We don't get to see it as much. And it's hard, man. It's hard giving up even a little bit of size. I mean, you can look at Canelo. Like he didn't have a field day against Bill it was just a little bit bigger than him. Not that much difference in them. But it makes a big difference. But Canelo, he does that wonderful move where he covers up, and as soon as they hit his guard, he hits with a beast of a left hook faster than they can react. But he was getting knocked a little bit off balance with that. He couldn't couldn't pull all the same moves. So Langford was special because he could fight the little fast guys and do really well, but he could also fight the bigger, tough guys who could batter you around and bully you. Part of what makes him stand out. Exactly, Scrap. So many fights that just didn't get reported. And I saw I saw stuff in the Philly newspapers of like late 1800s and the very beginning of the 1900s. Andy Watson, who you know Langford fought in like 03 and 04, but he um. You know, he got a, he got arrested for putting on fights. They were putting on nights of fights. And sometimes the results were reported. Sometimes they weren't. Sometimes you only got reporting because the principals were all arrested for running a house of ill repute, or however they put it. But basically putting on nights of fights because people love to bet on fights. You know, there were side bets going on. So it wasn't always just the purse had to be big. Sometimes if, if, they, if the fighters have a side bet, they can go fight in private and then the people who are there can bet on the fight themselves. But the fighters are betting each other or their manager's representation of betting each other. So there's money at stake for them, whether or not there's a purse. Joe Gans did that. He fought in private. Fought, I don't know if he did, but he was supposed to fight Willie Fitzgerald in private for a side bet. As part of his schedule, he had fights in and around that time. He'd just stop off a few days after a fight, go fight this guy in private. 
And some of these Gans fights, like I'd said at the beginning of the stream, he would undertake to stop them or he would forfeit the larger purse. And sometimes the club would put money up too or the patrons would put money up. Multiple bouts. I, I need to collect those articles, do a talk on that too. Some of these challenge matches where, okay, so if you are, if the guy isn't in your class, yeah, but you undertake to stop him in 10 rounds or less, put some money on that, raises the stakes, even if the guy's overmatched. That's pretty cool. It's definitely interesting, like, in any era, it's always complicated with titles. But I think sometimes it's easy to forget that it's, it's never... It was never simple. Today gets so chaotic and so frustrating because fighters don't fight as much. So I guess there's an extra layer of frustration, whereas back in the day, you guys are fighting a lot of fights and exhibitions and things. So they were still fighting, even if they weren't always putting the title up. They were still busy. You could still see your favorite guys if you're in the air. You could see them a lot in general. It's not as a rule. Sometimes the champs, their, their activity would just drop off. But as far as the establishment champs, some of these other guys, no, not with Gans or Walcott or Langford. But some of the champs would be a little less busy. Joe Gans, you know, not all of his tights were, he had a lot of title fights, but he had a ridiculous number of just bouts in general. And same thing for Langford. He had a lot of fights for the colored titles, one fight for the world title against Walcott, but. He also did a crazy amount of work outside of that. Not everyone was like that. Some guys were like Jack Dempsey when he was the champ. He didn't have a whole ton of fights. He had some high-level stuff. He didn't have a whole ton. Which brings us back again to Joe Lewis. Part of the greatness of him was he was the champion. And in a way that Johnson had been just for a flash there at the end of 08 and the early 09, but Joe Lewis was the champ, and he fought a furious schedule. So you, you don't really get that up until that point, as far unless you start counting exhibitions. Because guys like Bob Fitzsimmons and some of these other guys, they were busy. If you look at their day-to-day -day schedule or week-to-week -week schedule, counting exhibitions, they were very busy men. And then add in theater engagements and speaking engagements, they were they were full time. But as far as actually fighting and fighting for titles, Joe Lewis was something special. Feed, what's up, sir? J. Ray Robinson beat the lightweight champion. The year in this program, incredible. The welterweight title, middleweight title. There's minutes from winning the light heavyweight title. Yeah, Feed, there's, there's good reason that J. Ray Robinson is celebrated as one of the absolute greatest of all time. Because I think it starts to come down to how many boxes someone checks. And that dude checks all of them. And even if, even if uh, there's a picture of him when he wasn't too old up in the upper left there, even when, even though Robinson wasn't giving up as extreme degrees of like weight as say a Fitzsimmons or Langford or a Greb, or even Catcher, I mean Catcher fought Johnson. It was a crazy size disparity, but but Robinson did fight above his weight. He was the naturally smaller guy than a lot of his opponents, and he did amazing things across the weight. So. It's possible to not check a box as hard as someone else, but still check as so many boxes across the board in a talk like we're going to be doing, that, where we're just saying greatest. It's like totally subjective that someone could outweigh work at one at the one weight at strictly middleweight by counting maybe fights they had. Just like if you you know like Robinson fought middleweights when he was still a welterweight, so. If you were ranking the greatest welterweights, you could, he already has a badass resume at welter, but you could add to it saying, well, he, when he was, at times, he was a welterweight just fighting bigger guys than himself. Langford did the extreme version, the most extreme version, because Langford was also short. He wasn't just light. Like Fitzsimmons, it was longer limbs, so he had a lot of leverage, but Langford was a, a stocky powerhouse, giving up a lot of size. But lots of guys have done it. And I'm gonna. I'm definitely gonna be counting that a lot in my list. 
That's right. That's right, Scrap. Can't say. Yeah, I saw it on the resume. Bobby Dobbs, another very underrated fighter. Pete says, it makes me wonder how good was Joey Maxson to beat Robinson and Floyd Patterson. Maxson was excellent. Well, like he weighed as low as the 140s. Did he weigh that much when he fought guys at 175 plus? So I'd have to look. I'd have to. I'd have to look. I don't think I even have my uh, my year to years. But I saw Langford get like by uh, early 1905 February. I think it was mid February. Fought Dave Holly for one in one of their fights. But Langford had about 15 pounds on Holly by that time. Holly was still, I think, in the mid to upper 130s. Life was up 150 or more. And it was 1905 was when he fought Jeanette. The first time, the first time he fought, some, like, gave up weight at a world-class level. But I don't know if he was doing it in his 40s, although when he was in the 130s, he was already fighting guy. When he was a lightweight, he was already fighting welters. When he was a welter, he did fight middleweights. But I, I'm i trying to think, but I think as far as light heavyweights and heavyweights, that might have been when he was around 150 pounds. But don't quote me on that. And his weight did go up and down. You know, as late as, as, late as um, the end of 1911, he came in against McVeigh at 161. That's um, at least from, from one source. Came in at 161 to McVeigh's, I think 201 and three quarter pounds. Yeah, he did fight He did fight Blackburn. And like many people who fought or knew of Jack Blackburn, Blackburn was a tricky ass fighter. He was a tough guy. He was so brilliant, so hard to land on to the point where even like the great Harry Greb's volume attack later in, you know, much later in Blackburn's career after he'd already been in jail and he was, wasn't the same himself. But even Greb, I think it said like he only, could only land one in 10 punches, which I guess is a low percentage for Greb with that, his kind of volume attack. But Blackburn was brilliant. It's no surprise that, that, um, no surprise that Lewis was so amazing because he, he had the natural ability and toughness and athleticism, but then Blackburn just drilled him all that genius. Yeah, that's right. Gunboat beat Langford in 13. They rematched. I think in 14 they rematched. Langford really put it on him. Yeah, Langford, toward the end of his prime, KO'd Harry Wills. The one stoppage was in the 19th round. Went through hell in that fight. Wills was huge. But by then, you know, by the time he was fighting Wills, he was light heavy slash heavyweight. Or today we would say light, light heavyweight slash cruiser, I guess. But Langford was already, you know, he was a little, a young and little dude to be fighting like Jeanette in 05 or and beating, never mind beating Jeanette in 06 and then losing to Johnson. He was in the 150s, fighting guys who career heavyweights. Just, just incredible. And I think also, you know, people say, talk about size, but a lot of these fighters, they're at their best when they're smaller, but we don't always get to see them give up size the degree they used to. Oh, Fulton's from Minnesota. He did beat Langford. He also stopped him. He beat him on points, I think, in their second fight. But in their first fight, 1917, he kept him on the end of his jab and bust his eye up and gave him nerve damage. That was one of the, that was like, you can really call that like the pivot point Langford, like as far as if he wasn't already out of his prime, he certainly was after Fulton putting him in the hospital, he, and he couldn't really see very well out of the other eye, out of his one eye, 
out of his uh, injured eye. So, yeah, Fulton was a serious dude. So many serious guys, you know. Some of these guys had did fantastic amounts of work, but maybe never held a world title or only got to fight for it once and didn't win. You know, like because, like I said earlier, the, the ratio of fights and high level stuff going on to how many title titles there are, but also title opportunities. It was so crazy that today it would it wouldn't translate well to today's era where people do want to see. Maybe they don't want to see quite so many titles out there, but. They don't want to see just a handful of weight classes where. And so if you're stuck in the middle of that weight class, it's just too bad. You can't compete if you can't fight above your weight. So there's, there's a lot more opportunities today. Some of these guys had to take what they could get. The guys like Blackburn up there in the top left on that graphic, who just, um, he just didn't get a shot. He fought guys that were. At least once, you know, he fought people. Fought people who contended for it, but he didn't get he didn't get a title, any kind of title shot. Right? Well, sometimes maybe that's the manager too. Get the right manager, you get your opportunity. So Langford and Joe Walcott here and Joe Gans, you know, they all had influential managers. Walcott at one point at least, Tom O'Rourke, a big time guy, was his manager. Joe Gans here, he had Al Hereford. Who's, who was director of, I think might have been the Eureka Athletic Club in, in Baltimore. And his brother was involved in booking fights and stuff. Hereford's brother as well. I think I've seen him in the paper. Langford had it. Joe Woodman had an influential manager who'd been involved with the Lennox Club in Boston before, before he became, you know, before the club closed and he became his full time manager. So people get opportunity, but certainly Johnson getting to fight for the heavyweight world title was epic. And that's partly why you see, like in this, where they list the heavyweight champions separately, Jeffries and then the colored champion, Denver and Martin. This from the year before. Jack Johnson won it for Martin. Like it was sort of accepted that wasn't going to happen. You know, maybe the reporting changes a little bit afterwards. Have to get into that. Otherwise, now I've been talking for an hour and a half in a row. Yeah, I think maybe I'll get off. I do need to get something to drink. I'm seriously dry. I'm pretty hungry. Thanks for tuning in, guys. It's been it's been groovy. I'll definitely do a more coherent presentation on this. I may even pre-record it and throw some music in the background. Just upload it instead of doing it as a live chat. But it's a lot of um, a lot of interesting happenings with the with the titles, especially when the when the champion gets hurt or even loses in a non-title fight. People start making claims. It's interesting how those play out. They often reunify later. Like the complete the competing claims get sorted out for money, and then. If they fight for prize, prizes, <laughs> you know, they actually have fights and then the money incentive gets them to unify, like with Gans and uh, I'm trying to remember who it was. It was a fighter in California where he was threatening to have his influential family in California ban interracial fights if Gans push, pushed the issue of his white lightweight title claim. Weird stuff. But I've got some great examples already already saved up and, uh, and clipped, and I've got some more in the works. I've taken some notes and figured out what I need to research, like what I need to search for, I should say, and clip. So it's definitely uh, definitely interesting, the, con- the concept of championship. It's not, so, it's not so simple today, but it certainly wasn't simple then. That's all I'm going to say. Go get myself a nice, a nice morning coffee. Just what someone needs who's been awake for ten thousand years. Thanks for tuning in. Pete, scrapbook, Bruce. Thanks for coming by, brother. Shout out to Hardline Boxing, the boxing librarian. Nick Harmer. 
Everyone uh, watching after the fact. Xavier, thanks to everyone watching afterwards. Thanks very much. We'll close it out. Let me find a nice picture to close it out on. There we go. Close out on Sam Langford's 1904. A couple guys we mentioned in there. We got Blackburn, Dave Holly I mentioned. Joe Walcott, the great Barbados Walcott, center on the left, in the center. But also his brother, Belfield Walcott up there, third from the left, top row. Andy Watson. You know, just one year, Willie Lewis, who went on to do some big stuff. Folks, thanks for making it this far. My hat's off to you if you made it this far. Keep your eye open for, I'm going to post it. Once we agree on a date, I'm going to post the uh, video link to our countdown, our upcoming countdown. The top 10 greatest middleweights in boxing history, according to Scrapbook, Hardline, and myself. Individual lists, ten individ- three individual lists of top tens, with no criteria, it's greatest. So we'll see how that comes out. Yeah, peace, scrap. Yeah, have a great day, everybody. Take care.